Thank you for that introduction. I was actually going to uh, tell you about going to New Brunswick and, uh, and everything like that. But it's, uh, it's great to be here. Um, you see familiar faces and you see new faces. And uh, so it's, it's really nice to be here. Um, I remember when we used to start the, uh, my father started the Bible studies in his house. And then we moved to Friday nights at a building. Then we moved to Saturday mornings. And so seeing it move around. And so it's just great to see it build and the Lord blessing it. Um, as was said, after high school, I, uh, I went to New Brunswick Bible Institute, headed out east, pretty far east, and uh, it was really, really good. I was planning on coming back here, going to John Abbott, and uh, pursuing youth and adult correctional intervention. So when I went there, I really fell in love with the Word of God, really enjoyed it, and I came back here for one semester, went to John Abbott, but decided I wanted to pursue biblical studies and then went over down to Chicago. Initially, I was planning on being there for four years to uh, finish my bachelor degree, but I met Hannah, and uh, now I am living down there with my beautiful wife. I graduated in May of 10, and then this past year, just worked with Ariel Ministries in the US. Um, I would go around to churches, teach on certain things. We do a lot of evangelism in the malls. You know, Israelis have their kiosks. They sell, uh, you know, Dead Sea creams and stuff like that. So we went and built relationships, and um, I'm excited to go back to school at uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. So all that said, it's uh, great to be here with you. And the music team, they sound so good, right? It's really great to hear them. Very good. I really appreciate what uh, the song that we sang, My Savior, My God, and, and I asked that we could sing it so that we could highlight one aspect of this song. Uh, the opening lines... They state, I'm not skilled to understand what God has willed or what God has planned. I only know at His right hand stands one who is my Savior. And the reason I wanted this song sung was because um, in my life, I've seen that I've always wanted to know God's plan. I've always wanted to know what He's doing. I wanted to figure out what God's will is. And this song, it makes a statement, we don't know what God has willed. We don't know what He's planned. We don't have that skill. But nevertheless, I'm going to continue on praising God. So while they couldn't see every little detail of how their life was playing out, they still understood the big picture. What is God doing as a whole? And I find that when I forget about the big picture, what God is doing, I most definitely forget about the smaller picture, the little things that He's doing in our lives. So I want to speak with you about that today, and that's why I entitled this, The Little Things. Let me give you an example of, uh, of what I mean. Uh, two years ago... I was driving down to Camp Shoshana, which is about two hours away, with a certain missionary. And uh, th- this missionary, uh, she, you know, she goes around to different churches. She speaks on certain subjects. And uh, so I asked her, share with me more, you know, what goes on? What are you, uh, what's happening in your ministry? And she began telling me all these things about what God is doing. She would be driving and she would run out of gas. And then the Lord would give her just the right amount to get to the gas station. Or she didn't have a place to stay and somehow the Lord provided one. Or she didn't have money and God provided. And it just seemed like um, God was blessing her in such a superb way. So after the car ride, I went back to my room or my, my cabin. And I started journaling about my faith. And I was feeling really insecure. Like, is God really doing anything in my life? And the conclusion I came to was either God is blessing this woman in a superb fashion or I'm not acknowledging what God is doing in my life. And so this is why this passage that we're going to be going over is so influential for me, because it seems like God is, uh, we sometimes treat God like an abstract person who worked in the Old Testament, who made all these prophecies, and then we're waiting for him to fulfill them. But it's kind of like right now, we're back in that 400 years of silence, just much more extended. But God is a lot more powerful, and what I've seen is that He's a lot more intertwined in the everyday things of our lives, in terms of the people we meet, the events we go through, and so on. So, let's turn our Bibles to 1 Samuel 18.30-19. through 19. Now, of course, it's, uh, it's essential to get context for our passage. What are we going to be speaking about? Where do we start off? Now, who was the first king of Israel? Saul, right, exactly. Now, was Saul a good king? No. 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 That's good. Why wasn't he a good king? (laughs) 
<laughs> What's that? Okay, well, while he was a king, why wasn't he a good king before the Lord? Jealous, right. He, he was jealous, he was unfaithful, and so on. Now, let's, let's actually look at one event. We're going to look, look, sorry, in chapter 13. Now, in chapter 13, this is one of the events where Saul shows how unfaithful he is. Now, we know that Saul was a king of Israel, and they're about to go to war against the Philistines. Now, you can imagine, if you were Saul, you would want to make sure everything was in place. You're about to go to war, and the Philistines are a strong people. Now, he had to wait seven days for Samuel to come. Samuel was a priest, and Saul was a king, and their offices weren't allowed to intermingle. Because Saul was a Benjamite, he was from the tribe of Benjamin, and Samuel was from the tribe of Levi. So they weren't allowed to intermingle, and what they had to do was they had to wait for Samuel to come and offer a sacrifice. So Saul's waiting there, you can imagine if you're Saul, and Samuel says, I'm going to be there in seven days. You think, okay, great. Seven days pass, and Samuel's not there. Things get a little stressful. Not only that... But it says in verse 8, Now he waited seven days according to the appointed time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So not only was this priest not coming to sacrifice and give an offering to the Lord for your war, but the people who you're depending on to win the war are starting to leave. They're starting to get scared. That would be kind of stressful, right? So what does Saul do? He offers the sacrifice which you were not supposed to do. And then it says, As soon as he finished offering the burnt, the burnt offering, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him and to greet him and probably thought everything was okay. And what did Samuel say? What have you done? We see the conclusion in the following verses. Samuel said, You have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord. Therefore, the kingdom will be taken away from you. The Lord has sought out someone for himself, a man after his own heart. So we see that Saul was appointed king. Saul didn't do a good job. He offered the sacrifice, which he was not supposed to do. He feared men more than he feared God. Samuel came. He said, the kingdom is going to be taken away from you. And now God is going to get somebody, anoint somebody after his own heart. Now, do we know who that is? David, exactly. Initially, you might think it's Jonathan, as you're reading through this the first time, Saul's son, because right after this happens, you have Jonathan winning a war. So you might think, okay, that's going over here, but as the, uh, as the story continues, we see that Saul, or Samuel rather, was brought to um, David, and he anointed David. And 1 Samuel 16, 13, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, who was David, and the Spirit of God came upon David mightily. So we think, great, you know, they're looking for somebody new. And they finally found David, they anointed David, and, but Saul is still king. All right, things take time. Saul is still king. And then the next event which happens is David and Goliath. Now, everyone, everyone, most people interpret David and Goliath and they apply it to our lives by saying that we can face our giants, right? You have giants in your life, the stone is usually interpreted as Jesus and you knock it down, which, which is good, it's true, but when you look at the grander context of what's happening in 1 Samuel, you see that Saul cared more about what man, man thought because they were scattering so he offered the sacrifice. He cared more about what man thought than what God thought. So God said, I'm going to look for somebody after my own heart. And therefore, he went to David. He anointed David. And then we see that David is a man after God's own heart. In the story of David and Goliath, you, could, you, know, you all know the story. Goliath is there. He's saying, who's going to challenge me? Who's going to fight me? All the Israelites were scared. And what did David say? He said in verse 26, David spoke, what will be done for this man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? He cared nothing about his height or how powerful he was. All he cared about was that he was uncircumcised. He was not with the armies of Israel. He was against God. So we see this contrast happening where Saul, who was anointed as king, is kind of going down the ladder, while David, this young shepherd boy, is coming up the ladder. This is the context, and then we get into 1 
for Samuel 19. So let's turn our Bibles there. Now, 1 Samuel uh, 19, of course, the, the chapter titles and the, the numbers and everything like that, they're not inspired. Um, they were added in for simplicity so that we could find our places. So the story actually starts at 1830, 1 Samuel 1830. And what we're going to do is we're going to see that there's really a part one and part two of this whole section. It's kind of like a play. You have scene one and you have scene two. And what we're going to observe is that almost the exact same thing happens twice in a row. Now, you would think that Saul likes David. Saul just redeemed... uh, I'm sorry. You would think... Yeah, Saul likes David. David redeemed Israel from Goliath. They're not slaves to the Philistines. And things are good. But Saul didn't like David. Do we know why? Jealousy, right? Everything was good until the women came out and they started singing. The women came out and what did they say? Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Then then Saul became very angry. He was very displeased. And then it says, Saul looked at David with suspicion from that day on. Saul didn't like David. He was very jealous of David because he wanted the praise of man while David was receiving it. So let's look. We're, we're going to go through this. So there's selfishness. There's a statement made, a suggestion given, and then an intervention. Now, normally I try to get them all to be S's. I couldn't find a sufficient S for intervention. Someone suggested supplant. But I'm going to keep intervention here. So we have these four things happening uh, each time. So let's, go, let, let's look at 1 Samuel 18.30. Here's what it says. Then the commanders of the Philistine went out to battle, and it happened as often as they went out that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so his name was highly esteemed. The first thing which happens is that there is a war. And David went out, and what happened during this war? David did a good job, right? He's highly esteemed. It's kind of like an onslaught going on. So David, he went out to war and he killed all of them. Now the first thing is war, but what's important to understand is that right before this, in 1 Samuel 18, Saul says in verse 17, For Saul thought, my hand shall not be against him, David, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. So what Saul really wanted was that David going out to war would be his downfall. That the Philistines would kill David. But it seems like right now they went out to war and David won. Does that make Saul happy? No. So next we have a statement being made. What is the statement? He tells Jonathan. It's in verse 1. He tells, it says, Now Saul told Jonathan his son and all his servants to put David to death. But Jonathan, Saul's son, greatly delighted in David. So a statement was made, Saul went to those who he trusted, he went to his soldiers and especially to his son, and he said, kill David. Now we know that Jonathan didn't kill David, but what's even more amazing is that God intervenes at this point using natural circumstances. Because just the chapter before, it says, now it came about that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David and Jonathan loved him as himself. God used the natural thing of the bond and the love between these two men to save David. So then what happened? A suggestion was made. Jonathan went to David and he says in verse 2 and 3, So Jonathan told David, Saul, my father, is seeking after you. Now therefore, please be on guard in the morning. Now the term be on guard is actually the same Hebrew term used of the cherub in Genesis. Remember when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden and then God put a cherub there to protect them from the tree of life so that they wouldn't live forever. And it says that the cherub guarded that tree. He made sure nothing would happen. So this is what Jonathan, Jonathan is telling David, hide. Make sure nobody sees you because Saul is after you. Now if the king's after you, you're pretty much as good as dead. And so he's saying, hide, stay in secret, and I will speak to my father. So he gives him the suggestion, and then Jonathan makes intervention. He says to 
his, uh, in, as a synopsis, he says to his father, first of all, why do you want to kill David? He didn't do anything wrong. And second, David just freed us from the Philistines. He's doing a good job. Why do you want to kill him? So what did Saul say? Then uh, he says in verse 6, Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan and said, As the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. We have a vow, and then the scene is over. He won't be put to death, and that's done. It says that uh, David came back to, uh, to be under Saul, and everything was uh, f- as formally as it was before. So imagine if you are David. Imagine that you're this young man who's doing well for his country, who has a heart after God, who was even anointed by the prophet to, um, to, to be king. He was anointed. And then you have the king of Israel after to kill you. You would probably turn around and I would turn around and say, God, what are you doing? What is happening? Why is Saul after me? And then Jonathan has to come and he has to tell me to hide And he has to go and make intervention for me. Jonathan, my friend, is the one who's doing all this. God, what are you doing? But I think that David was able to keep his faith and keep his love for the Lord because he saw the big picture, that God is in control. And so what David did, he realized that that is God's hand working. So let's go into um, part two of the scene. We're going to continue on. So we went up to 1 through 7. Now in verse 8, it says, when there was a war again. We don't know how much time transpired between verse 7 and verse 8. But we know that it began with a war the first time. You had all these incidents. Now there was a war again. Bad news. There was a war again. David went out. He fought the Philistines and defeated them with a great slaughter. So they fled before him. Now, do you think this made Saul happy? After all, he vowed not to kill him, right? Well, he tried to kill him right after, actually. It says there was an evil spirit with Saul, and as David was playing his harp, Saul shot his spear at him, and David was able to get out, which was great. But now, again, a statement is made. This time, he says it only to his soldiers. It says, then Saul sent a message He sent his messengers to David's house to watch him in order to put him to death in the morning. So David goes home and Saul says, go hide there, hide in the bushes, hide wherever, and and kill him right when he comes out. Now, you'll notice that this is different than the first time because now Jonathan isn't really in the whole scheme. He isn't really in the plan, so Saul probably tried to put him to the side and make sure he didn't know about it, so no intervention was going to be made. So David goes home. Now, we, we know David's heart because we're going to look at this in a little bit. But in Psalm 59, it's actually a, um, a psalm written by David right at this time when the people were waiting to kill him. And we're going to see that he had his trust in the Lord even at this time. So Saul says, go, go kill them. And then there is, again, a suggestion given, the window. What happened is that he went home to his wife, Michal. It said, Michal, David's wife, told him, If you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be put to death. So Michal let him out the window, and he fled. Now, how did Michal get wind of this whole situation? How did she know? Most probably, she, she was a daughter of Saul, and probably Saul told her, in order that she wouldn't be hurt. And in order, if there was like an ambush on the house or something like that, he told her to watch out, to maybe stay away or something like that so she wouldn't be hurt. But she warned David, and David ran away. Now, first, I just want to, I just want to say here that, again, God works in such an amazing way because in chapter 18, it says that Michal loved David, And so Saul thought, I will give her to him that she may become a snare for him. Saul wanted his son to kill David, and David survived because God knit their hearts together. Saul wanted the Philistines to kill David, but David had success as a warrior because God blessed him. Saul wanted Michal to bring down David, but David was still saved through these natural circumstances. And every time Saul tried to bring him down, God used what Saul meant for evil to be for good. And at each of these points, David could have said, God, what are you doing? 
My wife has to shove me out a window in order to save my life. Aren't I supposed to be king? But he saw the big picture. He wasn't so focused on himself. He saw that God was working everything together for his good. And he was using natural circumstances to save him. Now, as a little, uh, as a little side note, we might think that Michal is a righteous woman uh, for having saved David. But as the text goes on, we realize that she is not. Um, at the end of this uh, little section here, the, the, the men, they come to the house and they say, let us see David. And what did Michal do? She took an idol and she put it in the bed. She dressed it up. She said, David's really sick. I'm sorry. Come back tomorrow. And they went back to Saul. They said that he's sick. And Saul said, I don't care. Bring him on his deathbed. I want to kill him. So they went back. They saw that it was an idol. And then Michal, uh, Saul called Michal to himself. He said, why have you deceived me like this and let my enemy go? And what did Michal say? David said to me, let me go. Why should I put you to death? So she lied about the whole situation. She pretended like she was innocent. Not only this, but we may question, why does David's household, why does Michal have an idol? Um, and I, I really enjoyed the uh, New American Commentary. They said that the, the Hebrew word for idol is teraphim. And what this is, it's a connection with Saul. Because about three chapters before, Saul did something really bad. God said, kill all these people. And Saul killed many of them. But he kept a lot of the animals and so on for his good. And that was really bad. And Samuel went to him and said, your sin is like idolatry. Where you care about this thing more. And so I believe that the author of 1 Samuel is making a connection with how Saul, he put his trust in the men and he put his trust in idols and did what he did. So it's the same thing with Michal. God, David trusted in God, but Michal put her trust in that idol to save David. And we understand that just as Saul lost the kingdom, so in 2 Samuel, Michal wasn't able to give birth. She lost the pleasure of having children. So it wasn't as though she was a righteous woman, but God still used the situation, natural circumstances, to save David. So what happens is that David, he ran away, and he went up to Samuel. He went up to the prophet. Um, Saul got wind of it. He sent his first group there, and what happened, they, they went up there to kill him, and then it says the Spirit of God came upon them, and they began prophesying. Okay, he sent his second group up there, the same thing, they began prophesying. The third group up there, they began prophesying. Saul went up there, and guess what happened? He began prophesying, exactly. So what does it actually mean uh, to prophesy? Um, many of us, we, we have this idea that prophecies are always these, these future events, something that's going to happen. But really, the, the office of a prophet is to speak the word of God. That's what was happening. So many say that as these men were going up, um, the Spirit of God came upon them and they began proclaiming the Word of God and they were steered away from their wrong mission, so to speak, to kill David. And so finally that happens with Saul and he begins proclaiming the Word of God. It's a sincere act of worship. Now we see this in the past, of course, when Balaam, we know that Balaam was sent to Israel to curse them. And then God made blessings come out of his mouth. And so God is really in control of all these things. So do we see the similarities between the two parts? There's always this war, and then there's an intervention made, first with Jonathan, then with Michal. And then there's a suggestion given to hide or go out the window. And then finally, this, this intervention where um, things are brought back together. And the reason I want to highlight this story is because I know that at my point, we said this before, if it were me, I would think, what is God doing? Why can't I become king? Why do I have to run away? Why do my friends have to help me here? Why does my wife have to throw me out the window in order to save my life? But David, we're going to see in Psalm 59, it's the next slide up here. These were his thoughts, but you, O Lord, laugh at them, those who are trying to kill him. You scoff at all the nations. Because David understood that God works mightily behind the scenes. So the way this affected me was, um, you know, when I first went to Chicago, 
and, uh, and I went to Moody, and um, you know, people would ask, you know, I'll, they would share stories how they got in their applications, and I would always say, oh, this, uh, this so-and-so professor got me into Moody. And looking back on that, I realized that God used that professor to get me into Moody. That God used situations to stretch me and to grow me. And most of the time, I didn't notice God working the little things in my life. So even now, I think about the parents I have, the friends I have, the struggles I'm going through, the, the, the things that my wife says to me on ways that I could improve. And I just think God working in the little things and, um, and seeing him manifest himself, really. The, the, the hard thing is that we, we could get apathetic and we could get passive about the living God. You know, you could focus on the end times, you could focus on what he's done. But the question is, what is he doing in our lives today? Because through this passage, you see that God is a lot more intertwined in our lives than we sometimes care to acknowledge, like myself. So I want to encourage you and ask you, do we acknowledge the little things that he's doing? The friends that you have, the situations you're put through, the struggles, because God is working with you. That is for sure. So I want to encourage you with that and um, be able to see God working in your life. To get in touch with us, you can do so by telephone, 1-888-685-5902. Locally in Montreal, 514-685-5902. You can also reach us through our website at www.arielcanada.com. Again, the phone number is 1-888-685-5902 or locally in Montreal, 514-685-5902. Website address is www.arielcanada, all one word, A-R-I-E-L, Canada.com. Be blessed. Shalom.